Good evening, everyone. I know people are still coming in, but we have a long panel, so we'd better get started. <laughs> Uh, thank you for joining us here at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs for a panel in which we will try to address from various angles the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the global implications of the war. My name is Yevo Yusanite. I am the Watson Family University Associate Professor of International Security and Anthropology, and I'll be the moderator of this panel. We have assembled a remarkable group of scholars and practitioners knowledgeable to speak about the matter, and the panel will be followed by a Q&A, so please keep your comments and your questions until then, whether you're watching online or joining us here live. At the UN General Assembly earlier this month, delegates noted that Russia's invasion of Ukraine was creating a new global era. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz said the West is now living through a Zeitenwende, a turn in the times. Other political leaders and public figures and scholars have been making similar remarks. It is an end of an era and the beginning of one. It may have veered history in a new direction. We are in uncharted territory. And though new and uncharted it may be, there are lessons to be learned by remembering, for we have really already forgotten the not-so-distant past. Uh, I was born in Lithuania under Soviet occupation, and I was around seven years old when Russian tanks rolled into Vilnius, which is the capital of the first country that declared independence from the Soviet Union. My mother packed us some clothes into suitcases just in case the soldiers would come at night and shove us into trains to, to be deported as they done decades earlier, leaving me and my brother with our dad, she left to join the freedom fighters. So images of human bodies crushed under Russian tanks as people stood defending the TV tower and the gov new government buildings, the buildings where my mother volunteered, those images have been imprinted in my mind. Years later, motivated to understand state violence and global politics, I decided to study international relations and uh, I stood at the square in Vilnius waving little blue NATO flags, celebrating Lithuania's acceptance into NATO, and holding hands with activist youth from Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, and other countries in the former Eastern Bloc, who were hoping for the same, our peers who, like us, looked to the West for security. The past two weeks, Probably like many of you, I could not peel myself off from the news. The old existential fear returned and with it my nightmares, but also the urgency to understand what is happening, why, and what's next. The war is in and for Ukraine. It is the Ukrainian people who are fighting on the front lines. Some have been doing that for eight years. The people in Ukraine who are trying to survive but it is more than that. On the eve of the invasion, President Volodymyr Zelensky said that the future of European security is being decided now in Ukraine. More recently, he said that the, this war is for all the world. And it does seem that the whole world is now reacting in ways that have started to shift the tectonic plates of post-Cold War global politics. So today you will hear from panelists who each bring a different perspective and the unique expertise as well as personal experience that will shed light on various aspects of this war. How did we get here? What should we be paying attention to? From mass displacement, there's been an exodus of over two million people already from Ukraine. Even more have been internally displaced. The to the role of China, the response of European states and societies against the invasion, to the questions of military strategy and cyber war. I ask the panelists to keep their opening remarks brief, no more than five minutes. So we will begin with Anna Lisianskaya, who is professor of computer science here at Brown, and she will be speaking about the impact the invasion has had on Ukrainian citizens and people who live in Ukraine. 
So uh, I wrote down a few remarks because I was worried that I was going to start crying if I, uh, if I didn't have a little cheat sheet. So I hope you'll forgive me for reading it. So, um, so to an ordinary person, the notion of a totally unprovoked and brutal aggression by Russia towards Ukraine seems very surprising. Surely they think there must be some mistake. How can it be that one day the Ukrainians are minding their own business, debating their coronavirus response, cheering on their Olympians, and having robust political arguments on issues like education reform and anti-corruption strategies. And the next day, they wake up to bombings and shellings of their cities, destruction of hospitals, schools, and historic sites, countless civilian deaths, and for what? For, for no reason other than what Putin said, that Ukraine should not exist because it's really part of the Russian world. And he also said that it needs to be liberated. By that, he means that instead of the democratically elected government of Ukraine, um, he believes there should be a different government that takes its orders from Moscow. This is so shocking that if you're, if you're hearing it for the first time, you might be wondering, is this really what's going on? Am I really telling you the, am I, Anna, really telling you the full story? Or is there something that maybe I'm omitting? Maybe I'm misrepresenting the, the, the situation. Maybe there is some legitimate grievance or security concern. And I have to assure you, there is none. <laughs> this is it. Russia's only grievance is that it has lost control over Ukraine. In other words, that Ukraine is a sovereign nation that controls its own destiny. And Russia's only security concern is that as such, as a sovereign nation, Ukraine is capable of defending itself against Russian aggression, as we are witnessing right now. So and some voices are saying, well, surely, war could have been avoided. It can always be avoided. Why didn't they negotiate more? And if you were following the news, then you may, it probably didn't escape you that they negotiated ad infinitum. But Russia still has this uh, concern that Ukraine is a sovereign nation, and that didn't go away as a result of negotiations. So Russia still attacked. Um, so what's happening right now? So I am um, from Kiev myself. That's where I grew up. That's where I went to high school, and then I came to the U.S. to go to college, and I, and I stayed here, and um, now I'm, um, I've been um, at Brown for 20 years. Um, but of course, my childhood friends, most of them are still in Ukraine, and I am in pretty you know, semi-regular contact with them, as I'm sure all of you are with your high school friends. Mm -hmm. And so over the last two weeks, I, <laughs> I kept, you know, asking them, how are you doing? What is going on? And the response that I got from, and of course, this is anecdotal. I'm just telling you my firsthand experiences from the people that I'm in touch with. But the response is from everybody, doesn't matter you know, what their overall kind of political leanings are, is that we have to fight. We have to defend our country. We have to defend our future. We do not want to live in a fascist dictatorship which is what Russia is right now, which is what Russia wants Ukraine to become. So they are very sure that that, that is the right course for them. And unfortunately, it means war. <laughs> so this war was, of course, a complete shock to them, but also it's business as usual. It's a complete shock for completely understandable reasons. Um, but it's business as usual because it's actually um, Russia's attack on Ukraine started eight years ago when Russia seized Crimea and also seized, although it pretended not to, the eastern part of Ukraine, which is the Donbass region. And um, eight years ago, we also had a lovely Watson Institute event, which either Michael or I organized, I, I don't remember. Um, at which um, our dear colleague, who's no longer with us, Pat Hurley, he spoke. Um, and it was a few weeks before Russia seized Crimea. And Pat knew that that was going to be Russia's next move. She could tell. She predicted it. So 
to go back to, yes, we can learn from history because Pat Hurley, he was a, a historian. Um, and uh, so this is business as usual. This has been going on for eight years. This is also why President Zelensky, after repeated warnings from President Biden um, about the, the, um, uh, the, the invasion coming up, he kept saying, yes, but what else is new? Of course, we're at war with Russia. That's, that's why, in spite of all the intelligence, they were not you know, ready that instant. Um, so what's going on in Kiev, just to conclude, um, the people that I'm in touch with, they cannot really continue with their daily lives. Uh, there's intermittent bombings and shellings. It's been a little bit less heavy in the last couple of days than maybe a week ago. And so their reports are saying, oh, it's, it's, it's OK now. <laughs> They're saying, oh, yeah, no, no worries. We were able to get a few hours of sleep. We were even able to like stay in our apartment for a little bit. Oh, we were able to go and take a walk. Um, but when, for, for several days, when the bombings and shellings were very heavy, um, they had to sleep in their basements. And it's not their basements. It's basements of like large apartment buildings. So in the basement, there would be a parking garage where all the residents who didn't manage to make it out of the city would be sleeping. Um, and that is sort of the universal experience in the city of Kiev. Um, some of my friends, they have uh, r relatives um, in other parts of Ukraine, and so they left the, the city uh, thinking that they would be safer in a more rural area. Um, and some of them, especially old, um, elderly people who are in no position to help the war efforts, they're the, they're the ones who have, uh, some of them have made the very difficult journey that has taken up to five days of bus rides, like standing room only bus rides, to make it to, um, to the border and, uh, and on. So it is, I think I, my time is up, so I'm gonna stop. <laughs> but uh, that is my summary of what's going on. Thank you, Anna. Our next panelist is Adam Levine, Director of the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies and Professor of Emergency Medicine. Thank you. So unlike many of the folks on this panel, I have never worked in or even visited Ukraine. Uh, but I have uh, worked in a number of conflict and post-conflict settings around the world, personally delivering humanitarian assistance and then also conducting research in partnership with local and international humanitarian providers on how to improve the delivery of humanitarian assistance. So this gives me a little bit of insight into the current humanitarian situation, the perspective on what it means in the world, and also where things are likely headed based on the experience, unfortunately, of so many other humanitarian emergencies over the past 30 years. So many of you have seen the headlines that today the number of refugees uh, leaving Ukraine passed 2 million, according to the United Nations estimates. And the United Nations actually has a plan that is preparing for 4 million refugees uh, total over the next uh, few months. This would actually make the refugee crisis in Ukraine the second largest in the world after Syria, which has 6.5 million refugees. But I think the estimates are likely underrepresented. That's really only for the next few months. And if this conflict grinds on through the end of the year and for years to come, which I think is very likely, the number of refugees could easily pass the 6.5 million mark, making this the largest refugee crisis in the world. Where are those refugees? Most of them are, actually the majority right now, are in Poland and then in other Eastern European countries bordering on Ukraine. This is important because even though these countries are high income countries or upper middle income countries, absorbing that number of refugees is a stretch for any country. And there's absolutely no way, even as they welcome them with open arms now, there's no way in the long term that they will be able to sustain hosting that many refugees. And so unfortunately, while right now so many refugees will wanna stay close to the border with hopes of returning uh, the reality as this conflict grinds on is that they will need to be moved to other countries in order to help uh, spread the, uh, the work. We know from the Syria conflict, Turkey and Jordan and Lebanon opened their arms and welcomed in six and a half million refugees in the space of a few years. But as time has gone on, uh, local 
resentment of those refugees has grown. And it's going to be really important that the humanitarian community and that uh, the countries of the world prepare for that and prepare to ensure that there is enough support for the countries hosting refugees so that they uh, are able to continue to provide them opportunities to work, opportunities for housing. One thing that's really important is that these countries avoid uh, the temptation to create refugee camps. They should learn from the experience of Jordan, which actually managed to absorb two million Syrian refugees as an upper middle income country and only 20% of them in refugee camps, 80% living in independent housing in urban centers. Uh, refugee camps, even when set up temporarily, have uh, the ability to last for a very, very long time. And they are essentially open air prisons. The best of them, white collar prisons, the worst of them, concentration camps, even in the best settings. And so everything should be done to try and avoid housing refugees in refugee camps. Of course, the refugee crisis is actually only the tip of the humanitarian iceberg. For as many refugees as have left uh, Ukraine, the UN estimates that there'll be up to 6.7 million internally displaced people within Ukraine. Those are people who are displaced from their homes, but still within the boundaries of Ukraine. And these people are way worse off than refugees because they do not have the access to international refugee protections that are afforded to refugees. And they also are gonna have much more difficult access to humanitarian uh, supplies. Beyond those displaced internally, there are also those who are still living in their homes, but have no electricity, no water, no access to food, no access to uh, local health care facilities, no pharmacy to refill their prescriptions, no schools to send their children to, no internet services because of the destruction wrought by the uh, Russian Federation. And as a result of that, there are many people who are still in place who have incredible need. So overall, the UN estimates actually 12 million people in Ukraine will have uh, human need for humanitarian assistance, which is three times the number of people outside of Ukraine needing humanitarian assistance. And what that means in logistical terms, you know, just even meeting the bare minimum according to international guidelines, uh, that means 180 million liters of water every single day. That means 2.2 billion kilocalories of food every single day for those 12 million people. That means housing on the order of 380 million square feet of housing to house that number of people. So these humanitarian needs are tremendous and by themselves would make this uh, you know, one of the largest humanitarian crises in the world, even outside of the geopolitics associated with it. So where's that aid gonna come from and how's it gonna happen? Well, many people in the world are giving money and that is wonderful. Millions of dollars have already been raised, but private donations are gonna be a drop in the bucket. 90% of all humanitarian funding in the world comes from governments, and the need for money to support those kinds of logistics are not on the order of tens of millions or even hundreds of millions, but on the order of billions of dollars per year. The UN is estimating a need of $1.7 billion just in the first few months. And so it's gonna be the governments of Europe, the governments of the United States, and more far-flung governments such as Japan and. Australia and perhaps those in the Middle East who will need to provide funding for this. Um, and that funding should be administered in very specific ways. So it should be as much as possible given to, firstly, the local governments, so governments of Poland and Moldova and others that are hosting refugees, and to the greatest extent possible to the government of Ukraine to provide assistance within the country. But when that's not possible to local humanitarian NGOs and international humanitarian NGOs partnering with them, especially to deliver assistance in Ukraine, which will become increasingly difficult as the crisis grinds on and the Ukrainian state is disrupted. Um, it's also important to know that as much as possible, that assistance should be delivered via cash whenever markets are able to support it so that you can use the funding to stabilize markets within Ukraine as opposed to displacing markets in Ukraine. Last point that I just want to mention is way outside of Ukraine, this crisis is having an effect on humanitarian assistance around the world just because of the disruption in wheat production and also because of the rising fuel prices. Humanitarian assistance runs on fuel. Delivery trucks that bring in food, uh, power for generators that run hospitals, and already even in places as far away as Yemen and Myanmar, we're seeing humanitarian costs increasing and therefore the amount of services humanitarian actors are able to deliver 
dropping. This means that in the long term, because of this crisis, mm -hmm. governments are going to need to cough up more money to support the ongoing humanitarian crises around the world, even as they spend more money on the crisis in Ukraine. Thank you, Adam. Next, we have Lyle Goldstein, visiting professor of international and public affairs. Thanks very much. Um, I'm uh, honored to join the panel. Um, I'm, I'm a specialist in military strategy, so let me, uh, let me try to add a few points of, about the, what we're observing in this, in this war. I, I should start by saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really sad and, and horrified by the Russian invasion, like everyone. Um, I think, you know, to summarize the situation, it seems to be a, a near total military disaster for Russia. Um, you know, not only is the country uh, massively isolated, but it, it seems to be demonstrating for all its, its uh, uh, substantial military weakness. Um, moreover, you know, uh, Putin seems to have been concerned about NATO, and yet NATO is growing uh, vastly stronger as we speak. So, you know, that, that's totally contrary to his goals. And uh, Ukraine also looks to be incredibly hostile to, uh, to Russia for the foreseeable future. So again, you know, it, it seems far-fetched even uh, that he may even achieve the minimum of his, his goals here. I, I would summarize the conflict as, as uh, we see it by saying that um, uh, really the, the, the most important factor here is, is Ukrainian uh, morale. Uh, you know, we've all seen the uh, how bravely uh, Ukrainians are defending their own homes, uh, taking up arms against a, uh, a superior force um, in, in numbers and, and also uh, the, the quality of armament. So it's really uh, quite stunning to behold, and we have to um, admire uh, their courage. Um, you know, this military disaster for Russia has already been compared to uh, the Winter War against Finland in 1939, and um, Russia suffered huge losses in that war, 150,000 dead and, and thousands of tanks and aircraft, uh, and again, revealing its weakness before World War II. So, so it's not um, outlandish to, to make such a comparison. Why is this happening? Um, uh, the planning seems to have been uh, a, t a total failure, uh, too complex. Uh, the operations were highly risky. Uh, the rules of engagement were also an issue that is you know, at first, I think Russian troops did want to avoid uh, massive civilian casualties, so they held fire, but that, you know, was not sustainable. Uh, from a military point of view, uh, their tactics are, um, are, are uh, often proving a failure to, to use combined arms, which is essential in modern warfare. Uh, and you see, as a result, you know, whole columns destroyed on the roadside and so forth. Uh, they, they don't seem to have a good answer for uh, systems like Javelin and Stinger. Uh, Russian air power has not been uh, employed to the fullest extent. Um, we can talk about some of the reasons. And, and Russian losses seem to be uh, unsustainable. And, and a key point, again, the opposite of what I said before, is that Russian morale seems to be very low. And that's partly, indeed, because Russian soldiers did not want to uh, fire on their, their Slavic brethren, it seems. Um, and, and nor were they even explained why they were doing this. Um, Okay, a few caveats here, though. Uh, I don't expect, you know, a, uh, the Russians uh, to, to uh, surrender or something in the near future. Russia still has a very substantial firepower. Uh, for example, uh, uh, you know, um, rocket fire um, systems that have not been substantially employed. There is a chance that Russia will achieve a victory in the, in the, in the eastern part of the country surrounding a large uh, group of Ukrainian forces, so that's possible. The Russian Navy hasn't really been brought to bear either. They have substantial naval infantry, and, and here I'm thinking mostly of Odessa in the, on the western side. And we, we have to remember that Russia has been fighting in Syria and also in Chechnya, for that matter, at similar kinds of grinding uh, uh, terrible wars, and so they, they have, do have some substantial experience, and, and I guess in that sense we should remember even the winter war against Finland, um, you know, the Russians were able to somehow kind of pull out a victory in the negotiation. Um, you know, some questions I have, uh, maybe for the rest of the panel, um, how does this end? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's very troubling to think about. Uh, another question, is, is there a mediator? 
I think Putin just talked with the Israeli Prime Minister. That's quite interesting. I think we, we badly need a, a mediator. I, I think it is, you know, I, I don't know, during the war it's hard to talk about the war's origins, but I, I'm one who do, does think the war could have been prevented. Um, and finally, uh, one issue I'm working a lot on and, and very disturbed by is the prospects for escalation. And here I include, uh, unfortunately, I have to say, nuclear escalation. You know, Russia is an extremely robust nuclear power. Well, there's my timer. Uh, I'll just, I'll just uh, conclude by saying I, I do think there are substantial nuclear risks here, and I think we, we still need to be uh, very cautious in this conflict. Thank you. Thank you, Lyle. Um, next, we have Timothy Edgar, Senior Fellow in International and Public Affairs. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to talk. Um, is this on? I'm going to talk about the cyber and information war aspects. Um, and <clears throat> just to be fairly brief here, uh, what we have here is very much the dog that didn't bark, uh, or maybe I should say the bear that didn't growl. Um, we expected a wave of crippling cyber attacks to precede the invasion. Uh, that was predicted um, by most analysts. Um, and we did see a wave of cyber attacks. In fact, it was really the third wave uh, in the hours before the invasion, um, because there had been previous cyber attacks in January. Um, these were uh, two big uh, examples I'll give are DDoS attacks. That's the kind of attack where you take down a website with massive amounts of requests. Um, those were made on government websites and banks by the Russians. Um, um, and then there was also a, a very kind of nasty type of malware, uh, wiper malware disguised to look like ransomware. Uh, many of you may know what ransomware is. Uh, it encrypts your files, and then you have to pay a ransom to the group in, in cryptocurrency. This was uh, not actually encrypting any files. It was just destroying them, but disguised to look like that. Um, that affected many government websites and computers inside Ukraine, including border control. Um, so they were very indiscriminate, this uh, wiper malware uh, going after these kind of civilian functions that did have an effect, uh, at least in the initial uh, few days, uh, on, on slowing down those refugee flows. Um, so OK, that's, that's what we expected. Perhaps what we didn't expect is how ineffective these attacks were going to end up being. Um, the, the DDoS attacks had a negligible effect. The websites were back up in hours. Um, the wiper malware, perhaps more so, but Microsoft's threat center in Seattle spotted that attack, uh, spotted that code very quickly. Um, within three hours, had developed um, uh, had developed a defense in its virus detection software. Uh, a few hours later, called the White House. Um, the CEO of Microsoft got involved. Uh, top White House officials got involved, were able to share that information that same day uh, in East Eastern Europe. Um, there was a, a Belarusian uh, hacker group called Ghostwriter uh, that was part of the information war, was supposed to be part of the information war, um, hijacking Facebook, uh, Twitter, and YouTube accounts to post fake surrender videos, allegedly on behalf of Ukrainian officials and public figures. Um, but those companies figured that out very quickly and locked those accounts down. Uh, so this is very much a success story of defense, um, both in terms of the larger industry as well as the Ukrainians themselves. Uh, people may not realize, but Ukraine has a very, or had, uh, prior to two weeks ago, Kharkiv was a center of IT in Ukraine. Um, now it's bombed. Um, but it shows the skill and uh, expertise available in Ukraine for cyber defense. Uh, and this has been eight years of planning, of support from uh, the U.S. and other NATO countries in uh, funding and in expertise and training, building up those cyber defenses, and it was uh, very much a success. The, um, the head of uh, security for the Ukrainian government, uh, I thought, uh, you know, said it well. He, he de he's described how uh, the attacks on Ukrainians, uh, Ukraine's power grid uh, even its nuclear uh, stations, its, its cyber attacks were ineffective. Uh, they were able to defend against them. Unfortunately, not able to defend against the bombs and the missiles uh, uh, as well. Um, because those attacks didn't succeed and Ukraine was able to stay connected to the internet, 
um, it's winning the information war uh, pretty dramatically. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's charismatic president is able to put up videos uh, rallying his people. Um, there are videos of ordinary citizens defending themselves <laughs> against tanks. Um, uh, there's uh, inspiring examples of defiance, uh, a, a young girl singing, um, uh, you know, a Disney song, I I you know, in a shelter and just makes your heart ache. Um, all of this is made possible by the fact that the internet and communications infrastructure of Ukraine remains intact, uh, despite the expected cyber attacks by the Russians. Uh, instead, uh, Ukraine has been able to go on the offensive in this war. Uh, they uh, recruited they 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 recruited uh, people from around the world uh, not only to go and and, and fight physically but uh, a much larger group they're calling the IT army now 400,000 strong um, to conduct cyber attacks against Russian targets uh, to try to get information behind what is a new kind of informational iron curtain uh, we see that instead of Ukraine being cut off from the internet by cyber attacks uh, Russia is cutting itself off from the internet to try to shield its own citizens from what's happening in Ukraine. Um, Anonymous, the hacker collective, uh, has uh, stepped up and uh, launched uh, significant uh, cyber attacks uh, on Russia to try to get the word out about what's going on there as well. Um, we still don't know. It's very early, 12 days into this war. Will Russia strike back at U.S.? Um, critical infrastructure, um, you know, we don't know, but I, you know, we, we've had statements from President Biden uh, uh, warning the Russians about potential retaliation if they try to do this, um, but we're going to have to see in the days to come uh, whether the cyber war escalates or whether it turns it to fizzle out uh, for some of the same reasons that perhaps the kinetic war did, uh, as Professor Goldstein talked about. Thank you. Nadia Al Ali is Robert Family Professor of International Studies and Director of the Center for Middle East Studies. Thank you. Um, like Adam, I'm not an expert on Ukraine, neither on Eastern Europe, but I've worked a lot in the context of war, conflict, and displacement, and especially in relation to Iraq. And also, I agreed to speak on the panel today because it's International Women's Day. And I thought I wanted to make that link. I know that here in this country, people know about International Women's Month, which I think was initiated by President Obama. But I think very few people know the history of International Women's Day, which actually the idea emerged in 1908, uh, when a group of 15,000 women marched um, through New York, demanding shorter working hours and better pay and the right to vote. And it was Clara Zetkin, who is a communist activist and an advocate for women's rights, who suggested the creation of an International Women's Day. And she put this idea to a conference in Copenhagen in 1910, where 100 women attended from 17 countries, and they agreed. So it was first celebrated in 1911. But interestingly, it was only formalized um, during a wartime strike in 1917 when Russian women demanded bread and peace. And four days into the strike, the, the Tsar was forced to abdicate and to the provisional government then had to grant women the right to vote. And from this time on, the 8th of March became International Women's Day. And then in 1975, the UN started making it um, you know, an official day. And I wanted to share with you what um, the Ukrainian member of parliament, Kira Rodit, said today to the women of the Ukraine, and I quote, it is already past midnight in Kiev and it's inter it is officially International Women's Day. Usually these days kids give their moms cards, flowers to say how special they are. This year our kids have been robbed of this holiday. They are either in refugee camps or very far away from us. This year, Ukrainian women are not only holding flowers, but also guns to protect our country along with our men from Putin. Now, on this International Women's Day, I wanted to not only think about the way that war and displacement affect women in specific ways, but I also wanted to give a very brief feminist angle on recent um, events. 
So um, as we heard already before, prior to this recent invasion, now the conflicts in eastern and southern Ukraine have constituted a significant humanitarian crisis. And you know, often what we see happening in humanitarian crisis and wars is that um, gender-based violence actually increases. There's a direct relationship between um, war, acute war and armed conflict and domestic violence. Um, and we uh, have seen that um, you know, gender-based violence and also more patriarchal gender norms and relations have actually increased. There was a, conf there was a survey done in 2015 already by United Nations Population Fund, which stressed the shifts and that women were really pushed back. Um, now, of course, in the last weeks since the invasion uh, of Russia, we have seen these heart-wrenching photographs of women giving birth in underground metro stations and newborn babies hastily being moved to makeshift bomb shelters. Of course, another big problem in terms of the gendered implications of war and conflict are that reproductive health is very much affected. A very another important uh, element in terms of gendered implications is that is the trafficking that happens. And in Ukraine, we've seen that since 2015, human trafficking has been endemic. And there's actually been a shift because pre in previous years, the main victims of human trafficking were actually men who were trafficked for labor exploitation. But since 2015, it's been mainly women who have been tra trafficked for sexual exploitation. But I also want to say that, you know, for me, a feminist lens is an intersectional lens. So I'm thinking, you know, particularly also about the Roma women, the women with disabilities, internally displaced women, women from rural areas, and older women who have been facing more forms of marginalization. But I can't help to also not mention, although you know they are not necessarily women, but when I think about the situation from a feminist perspective, what immediately comes to mind are also the refugees um, of color, black refugees who are either students or workers in Ukraine and who are actually not right now welcome at the borders of Poland or other European countries. And I think that's something that you know we also have to think about how um, I mean, this is in no way to diminish the suffering and the plight of Ukrainian refugees, but also to remind ourselves, yes, but they are welcome while other refugees, um, there are all these uh, stories of, for instance, African students who are actually caught in Ukraine and they can't move on. But I also want to make sure that we don't just paint women as victims of war. I mean, women have fought alongside men in the conflict in eastern Ukraine as members of the armed form forces, volunteer battalions, and rebel groups. And also women have, are actually, I think, according to the uh, Ukrainian Minister of Foreign Affairs, 15% of the regular Ukrainian army uh, are actually women. And although women do not play any official roles in the uh, various peace initiatives, they have been involved in these informal uh, attempts, you know, as civil society leaders, as journalists, you know, to, to bridge, to discuss ways to help end the conflict. And, um, you know, I don't want to <laughs> make myself very uh, unpopular by uh, ending my intervention by quoting a Russian feminist organization. But I think, you know, it's important because I, so I'm, I've, studied a lot uh, the situation in Iraq, and not only the American invasion of Iraq, but also when Iraq invaded Kuwait. And I mean, I have Iraqi had family there, and I didn't know one person in Iraq who was happy with the invasion of Kuwait. So I also want to think about, you know, so how do we end a conflict like that? We also end a conflict like that, that people in Russia need to object to what is happening. And so here I thought we actually can look to um, Russian feminists who have um, come out like a whole uh, network of feminists who have come out against the war despite the fact that that means risking their own lives. They're being persecuted, they're being arrested. And so let me end by quoting the statement by Russian feminists who said, as Russian citizens and feminists, we condemn this war.
Feminism as a political force cannot be on the side of war of aggression and military occupation. The feminist movement in Russia struggles for vulnerable groups and the development of a just society with equal society opportunities and prospects. And there can be no place for violence and military conflicts. War means violence, poverty, forced displacement, broken lives, insecurity, and the lack of a future. It is irreconcilable with essential values and goals of the feminist movement. War exacerbates gender inequality and sets back gains for human rights by many years. War brings with it not only the violence of bombs and bullets, but also sexual violence. As history shows, during war, the risk of being raped increases several times for any woman. For these and many other reasons, Russian feminists and those who share feminist values need to take a strong stand against this war unleashed by the leadership of our country. And the statement finishes with the following words, we are the opposition to war, patriarchy, authoritarianism, and militarism. We are the future that will prevail. And I have to say, in the context of the work that I do in the Middle East, I see that also in Turkey, in relation to Erdogan, or in you know, several other countries, it is at, at the time you know, feminist activists who are at the forefront of not, trying to, not only trying to um, advocate for greater gender-based rights and justice, but are also challenging authoritarianism and militarism. And to my mind, these are all linked. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Tony Levitas is Senior Fellow in International and Public Affairs. Uh, so good afternoon, good evening, everybody. It's a, it's a pleasure to see you here. Um, the last few weeks have been uh, rather surreal for me. I've worked with a team of Swedish and Ukrainian and Polish local government experts on uh, local government reform in Ukraine. And, you know, two weeks ago, the, the conversations at the weekly meetings were about uh, whether the invasion would go forward and the general feeling among my Ukrainian colleagues in Kiev was that, no, we're too big a frog to eat and he already has all the tools at his disposal to keep us uh, walking a, a high wire. We're already under attack. We're already in, unstable and fragile. Our politics are corrupted by the invasion. What does he need more? Maybe he'll take a big, bigger bite, but a real full-fledged invasion was impossible. And that was kind of the governing feeling in Ukraine uh, not long ago. Um, now those weekly meetings are uh, daily headcounts where you know the team convenes on Zoom and we see who's in what basement and uh, who's doing well and whose parents or friends or uh, relatives are in trouble um, and try and get them uh, whatever support we can give them. Uh, so it's a, it's a bizarre bar, bizarre scene and the the next week or two, I think, are going to be critical and ugly. As uh, Lyle mentioned, the, the Russian army has not yet pursued the tactics uh, that it pursued in, in, in Syria by carpet bombing. Uh, they don't want to. Uh, I think there's good reasons to believe that the Russian army is very unhappy with what's going on here. This is a war being fought largely in Russian on both sides. Um, the first language of the president is Russian. Um, but leaving that aside, let's shift to what I'm supposed to be talking about, which is the, the, the effect on European politics. Um, I think the meta-narrative of the conflict, the invasion, is uh, as hapless and feckless and incompetent and corrupt and unfair as uh, our democracies have been, uh, they sure as hell beat the alternative. <laughs> and uh, the choice across Europe between ethno-nationalism and the messy business of trying to govern ourselves as equals has really been put on a knife's edge. Um, 
And I think that's the turning point that, that we're seeing. It has at least temporarily um, knocked the wind out of the European right. Uh, you can see this in particular in R Poland and in Hungary, uh, but uh, almost to a man now, all of a sudden, uh, political parties in Europe that were talking about getting out of the European Union, about the, the German diktat calling Brussels Berlin, all of this is, has really stopped. And the president of Poland all of a sudden has from a Euro skeptic and from underneath a party that was looking to pull Poland out of the EU, or at least part of the party was, he's become the spokesman, he's become a Euro Atlanticist. Mm -hmm. And uh, the pressure being exerted on the right wing is significant. I think it's going to be interesting here, the bellwether Biden speech on, on uh, Oil prices will be a very interesting battle in that respect. You know, are will Americans accept the increase in oil prices as part of a sac sacrifice to defend democracy, or not? But the shift in 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 Europe has been remarkable. Um, the polls have behaved uh, rather remarkably with respect to the refugee crisis, um, at least for Ukrainians, they're not doing so well for foreigners and people of color in Ukraine uh, who are having trouble both getting out of Ukraine and then having a status in Poland. The society is really organizing itself to do this. Um, the lead agency is not the national government. The lead agency for a lot of this has been the uh, Association of Polish Cities, which is uh, really taken it upon itself both to change the legislation, so for instance, to allow Ukrainian teachers to teach in Polish schools, to allow Ukrainian nurses and doctors to move into the Polish medical system. Uh, they're really taking a, a lead on a broad range of fronts, uh, both in terms of preparing physical infrastructure and changing the legal apparatus to, to, to take in. Um, Refugees, the responses in other countries are equally shocking. I mean, the idea that Erdogan, who was not long ago in the dictator's club, would put the family jewels, the Bosphorus, uh, on the table uh, to send uh, weaponized drones to Ukraine, which apparently have been part of the reason for the, that's amazing. Similarly, the Swedes, the, the Swiss, have put their family jewels on the table banking secrecy, they're going to all of a sudden kind of seize r Russian assets. All of this puts us in uncharted territory, as I think Schultz said. How long it will go on and how successfully the, the right will respond to it, I think only time will tell. Obviously, the longer this goes on, the bigger the stress, as Adam said, it puts on, on the the countries of Europe in terms of taking uh, in refugees, dealing with energy prices and inflation that will make ours look minimal is the open question. And, you know, as I said, I, I'm sitting here speaking, worrying about, you know, are they going to start carpet bombing Kiev? Um, and the longer this goes on, the more likely that the carpet bombing of major Ukrainian cities uh, takes place. And, you know, I'm not sh sure, you know, what a protracted resistance looks like in, in these contexts. I'm almost, I'm really hoping uh, that uh, Russian feminists, Russian POWs, there's a remarkable video uh, of a Russian POW saying, you know, we were told we were coming in here uh, to get rid of a few Nazis, and nobody told us that what, what this was about, and it's a disgrace, and we shouldn't be here. And those things are getting back into Russia, How, what kind of mobilizing the effect they'll have, but I really think at this point our best chances are in a palace coup or an army insurrection.
uh, and I don't think it's impossible. I'm a little more optimistic than than Lyle, I'm, uh, uh, but uh, I think everybody should be mobilizing to support Ukraine uh, and Europe as a whole o over the long term, but praying that uh, it ends quickly through um, some sort of, of insurrection or palace coup. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> Next, we'll hear from Ed Steinfeld, Director of the Watson Institute and Dean's Professor of China Studies. Great, thank you, Yeva, and thank you all for being here tonight. I'll just offer uh, some quick reflections on, on uh, some ramifications for China and China's role in the current situation. So first, let me say that it's, it's not surprising or shocking that China in the weeks or months leading up to the Russian invasion was uh, not supportive of the US or NATO's position. I don't say this judgmentally or, or, or critically necessarily of US policy, but I think objectively it's true that over the last three administrations and certainly the last two, America's China policy has been about containing China, blocking China's rise. And in last October, President Biden uh, pushed NATO to make a statement despite some objections from NATO members, at least quiet objections, pushed NATO to make a statement that China represents a military threat. And at the same time, the G7 issued a statement that China represented an economic threat. So again, it's not surprising given this positioning that China, Beijing, was not uh, eager to jump to support NATO. And of course, extravagantly, Xi Jinping embraced, almost literally, Putin uh, just, just really weeks ago. Um, let me get to the second point. I'm going to return to the first, because I think the first point does represent some kind of failing of a security architecture in Europe, but also a failing of a security architecture in East Asia. But the second point is, um, look, there are myriad differences between the situation in Ukraine and the situation on Taiwan. Almost too many differences to, to even venture a comparison. But I will say this, the, the fact that NATO allies, despite hesitance and seeming distance from the US in the run up to the Russian invasion, the fact that they unified so quickly in opposition to the Russian invasion, I think is a good thing for East Asian security. If Beijing either felt the need to or a desire to resolve the unresolved Chinese civil war coercively by retaking Taiwan, the calculus that the US wouldn't react or that US and allies in East Asia, particularly Japan or South Korea, wouldn't react, that calculus changes now, by definition, given what's happened in Europe. It's not obvious that there are links between Europe and, and what's happening in Europe and East Asia, but Beijing has to be thinking about that. The third point, the fact that a seasoned Russian military, one that's been in combat in recent decades in, in Chechnya, in, in Georgia, in Syria, in Crimea, of course, in Donbass, that that seasoned military has so ground down and so unexpectedly, again, I think, has to change the calculus somewhat in Beijing about the idea, possibly, of coercively taking, <clears throat> pardon me, unifying, whatever term you want to use, coercively acting against Taiwan quickly before anybody can react. It just has to change the risk analysis, and to the extent that the Chinese military, like many militaries globally throughout history, including the US military, to the extent there's a degree of hubris in current planning, perhaps there'll be some rethinking of that um, confidence. Just a fourth point, <coughs> look, Russia, uh, China with respect to Russia, China is a much larger power and a much more globally engaged and globally integrated power. It's not surprising me, and I think it shouldn't be to anybody, that with the bogging down of the Russian military in Ukraine, with the unity of NATO allies, the West, against Russia, China too is now hedging and not so extravagantly embracing Russia, not, ex not embracing uh, NATO and the, and the United States either, but hedging in Xi Jinping's purported call today to European leaders and advocating for a ceasefire suggests that kind of near-term hedging. But I think there's a longer-term thing to pay attention to. The swiftness and severity of the sanctions that have been leveled against Russia 
by support, but sanctions including essentially the freezing of transactions involving Russia's foreign exchange reserves has to be a signal to China. It doesn't need this signal because it's been hearing it repeatedly. It has to be a signal to insulate itself and any of its potential partners from these kinds of sanctions. And I think we'll continue to see, there, this is long term, but continue to see efforts to de-dollarize and find ways to avoid having to um, engage in transactions in, in dollar-denominated de, uh, terms. And some of these efforts are facilitated by U.S. efforts to try to um, financially decouple from China, including you know, efforts to try to push the delisting of Chinese firms from U.S. stock exchanges. And that brings me just to a, a final point about security architectures. Uh, there is no, in my mind, no justification for what Russia has done in invading Ukraine, brutally unprovoked. But I think we can, we, while acknowledging that, we can also say that this war does represent the failure of a security architecture that was started to built really after the Cold War. And in many respects, it wasn't really built or rebuilt. It was an extension of a Cold War entity and set of Cold War institutions. It hasn't worked particularly well. My fear is that there is an equally or even more fragile security architecture in East Asia right now. American policy, again, is primarily one about, almost exclusively now, one about containing and blocking China, militarily and economically, keeping China outside of some kind of architecture for interaction. I think that's a dead end. Regardless of what we think about Chinese intentions, whether they're benevolent, malevolent, this effort to um, block and coerce and intimidate and deter, I think, does increase the risks for a conflict or at least create circumstances under which some of the players, including China, may want to test that architecture. The test that's now been applied to NATO, now in Ukraine, fortunately, I would say, has resulted in a, in a unified reaction, albeit too late, happened after a war occurred. I wouldn't want to see that test play out, actually in East Asia, and I think now is the time to start thinking, even though it's contrary to how many people think of this and how many people in the United States think of it, now is the time to start thinking creatively about some kind of architecture that includes, rather than simply excludes and blocks. Thanks. Thank you, Ed. Next, we'll hear from Omer Bartov, John Birkeland, Distinguished Professor of European History. Thank you, and thank you for pronouncing my name so perfectly. Uh, <laughs> um, you gave so, me three options. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly, <laughs> but, but you chose the right one. <laughs> so uh, I'm an historian, so obviously I think that this conflict is over history. Um, and it's fake history and true history and everything in between. Uh, but because it's about history, it's very hard to summarize in five minutes. <laughs> um, in, on the 22nd of February uh, uh, 2022, a Russian document was put online, which was shortly thereafter removed uh, because the war wasn't going as well as uh, they expected. And that document explained the rationale for the war, which was to normalize, to renormalize the situation of Russia, uh, which had been denormalized by the fall of the Soviet Union. And the goal was, of course, to unite the three Russias, to unite Great Russia with White Russia, that is with Belarus, and with Little Russia, which is Ukraine. Uh, and that is, in fact, the rationale behind this uh, war. Um, now, I would say that the, if, if you look at it historically, uh, the goal, the historical goal that uh, Putin has given himself is not so much uh, the reconstruction of the Soviet Union, but rebuilding the Russian Empire, uh, the great Russian Empire, uniting the Slavic peoples, and then, of course, uh, including all the non-Slavic spheres of influence around it. And we don't have time now to count all of those. 
In that sense, by the way, uh, the potential bombing of Kiev uh, is a contradiction in terms because Kiev in this uh, Russian narrative is the birthplace of Russia. Um, and so, so that is part of how crazy this entire event is. A second point that uh, Putin raised rather effectively, I would say, uh, was the argument that he, he is actually engaged in denazifying Ukraine. Uh, that managed to trigger a conversation in many places, which of course is based on turning history on its head. Now the term itself is related to the denazification efforts that were made by the Allies in the immediate aftermath of uh, the fall of the Third Reich, which was a highly dubious event. That's where the term comes from. But what it links, and uh, what Putin wants to link it to, is a long-term view of the Great Patriotic War, the name that Russia and, by the way, Ukraine also gives to World War II, and its role of, of this story of the war of holding Russian society together under the myth of unity of the Russians or the Soviet peoples, as they were called then, and of enemies, um, one, the, the sort of separation of the two. And that evokes the memory of Ukrainian collaboration with the Nazis. Now that is not like in all these, all myths, it's not entirely vacuous. There was in fact, particularly in West Ukraine, uh, which was um, historically not under Russian rule before 1939, it's a very different part of Ukraine, there was indeed a fair amount of collaboration with the Nazis in the murder of the Jews, and then independently of the Nazis, also massive ethnic cleansing of the Polish population there. So by evoking that, uh, Putin is trying to raise these memories. The point is, of course, that in the last decades, Ukraine has been making efforts to actually confront that past. That has been a very difficult process in Ukraine. It's not one-sided. It made me, for instance, somewhat unpopular in Ukraine because I kept reminding people of that history. But there has been an effort to actually confront that. And Ukraine itself has presented itself, quite rightly, as a much more diverse society than the ideals of Ukrainian nationalists in the 1930s and 1940s. But this serves for a variety of groups in Russia and outside of Russia, I would argue, to justify current Russian aggression. And it obscures, of course, the role of Ukraine as an example of a possible democracy right on Putin's border. That is, here is another Slavic country that was part of Russia historically and has actually been able to function uh, democratically. Now, in Ukraine, the, in, in the Ukrainian narrative of history, uh, its entire history, the entire history of Ukraine in, is made up of a struggle for independence. That is a deep part of the, the, the story, the narrative that Ukraine tells itself. Um, and Ukrainian nationalism from the 19th century tried to delink itself both from Russia in the East and from Poland in the West. We, we are not talking about Poland here, but it was very much part of that. Uh, Polish arguments were that Western Ukraine or Eastern Poland uh, was really part of the old um, Ukrainian and uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And the Ukrainians were really part of Poland, slightly more primitive than the Poles, but with a process of civilizing them, they would become part of Poland. And of course, the Russian view was that Ukraine was part of Russia, had always been part of Russia, and Ukrainians, little Russians, were those who were a somewhat more primitive version of Russians, but eventually would become part of Russia. So in this sense, the current war is really um, a, a part of a very long history. And if you think about it from the point of view of a Ukrainian memory, you could say the, the context of this begins at least uh, 
as uh, early as the 17th century. Uh, within that narrative, the first step to creating a Ukrainian state was in 1648, was with the uprising, the Cossack uprising of Khmelnytsky, of Bogdan Khmelnytsky in 1648, the creation of a free Cossack state. And that free Cossack state was already in that century taken over by Muscovy. There was no Russia there. Russia was invented in the 18th century. Uh, the term was taken from Ukrainian history. Uh, so th that is the first part. The second part is the, the attempted Russification of West Ukraine during World War I, when that area was occupied by Russia, by the Russian Imperial uh, Army. And there were efforts to uh, outlaw Ukrainian and to create Ukraine, West Ukraine at the time, which, as I said, had never been ruled by Russia, into part of Russia. Uh, the next part was the effort by Poland to take over those Ukrainian lands, which succeeded. Uh, and at, at that point, Ukraine was divided. West Ukraine became part of Poland, uh, despite a, a, a bitter struggle, a war that lasted a year between West Ukraine and Poland, and became part of Poland. And the rest of Ukraine, which was taken over by the Soviet Union, or, or Soviet Russia at the time, again, in a very bloody struggle. Uh, <coughs> Um, and, and, and finally uh, comes the point of 1939 in which Russia again, and we have to think about it now in terms of what is happening now, the Soviet Union took over uh, in an agreement with Nazi Germany, took over uh, Eastern Poland, which was Western Belarus and Western Ukraine and started the process again of uniting those parts of Ukraine into integrating them into uh, the Soviet Union. And the, the memories that are those that uh, Putin is trying to evoke now of um, uh, denazifying Ukraine in part have to do with the struggle that occurred between 1944 all the way to the late 1940s when what we see as the liberation of those areas by the Red Army was seen by many Ukrainian, as Ukrainians as a, as a reoccupation of their territories, which triggered an insurgency that continued and was finally bloodily uh, suppressed by the NKVD with multiple um, um, deportations of entire villages and large numbers of people uh, to Central uh, Asia and to gulags. So th this is the historical context, I would say, and this is what is in the minds of many people today who are engaged in this conflict, whether they're in Moscow or they're in Kiev. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, on our distinguished master panel, of experts, we have Michael Kennedy, Professor of Sociology and International and Public Affairs. I truly appreciate being here with this panel and being here with all of you right now. I too, like Anna, had to write up this because both parts of me, my analytical side, and my being are racked. And so I'm going to experiment with you a little bit. I'm not going to try to rack you too. But if you're not racked, you're not paying attention. We recurrently hear variations on this story. Russian forces are committing war crimes. So many Ukrainians are resisting. So many others flee their country seeking sanctuary. And so many others beyond Ukraine offer solidarity. That story is real. But it is also cultural politics. This story is part of a more general attempt to influence and transform the meanings, identities, values, and representations accompanying the exercise of power and influence. In what is to follow, I analyze the cultural politics 
briefly around this time. But I am also participating in it, as are we all. We are all struggling to give meaning to the crisis in which we live, because I fear this crisis is only going to grow. So the real is that we have an assault, resistance, and global solidarity. That's real. But alongside this is another account that deserves recollection. Putin was once a master of disinformation, but he cannot, as everyone has said, offer any more convincing lies about this war. His power now rests only in his brutality and in his capacity to disrupt, alongside threatening even worse things to come. Only a month ago, so many people in global media would talk about the reality of this Russian empire and how it is natural to have Ukraine restored to it. How Ukraine was not a quote unquote real nation and how it was inextricably part of Russia. I talked about this mythology on the trending Global A podcast that Watson puts out in February start. Last week in the seminar that Lyle Goldstein has begun weekly and again on Thursday, I extended my analysis from the beginning of February with this observation. Putin has lost this war. He has at least lost the cultural political war. When the United Nations General Assembly voted to condemn Russia's invasion, only five nations stood with Russia, and it was not good company. That vote is only one of so many expressions of the global rebuke of Putin. Putin's brutality, notice I'm saying Putin, not Russia. Putin's brutality has generated a solidarity hard to have anticipated just one month ago. Our Ukrainian friends may have told you of their faith in Ukraine's resilience. That faith has contributed to the solidarity we witness on Ukrainian streets and on the road, in the trenches and in their basements. Before Putin's 2022 invasion, we spoke of NATO's commitments to defend its members. But nobody could have told you that its solidarity would lead to dramatic increases in military aid to Ukraine, and that Finland and Sweden would rethink their own distance from this alliance. Before Putin's assault last month, the global public sphere might have occasionally referenced Ukraine. But when Adam Miknik said on February 24th, we are all Ukrainians now, that makes sense. While we would expect the legitimate political leadership of Belarus in the figure of Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya to declare their solidarity with Ukraine, and that Belarusian citizens would go to Ukraine to fight alongside their compatriots against Putin, we could believe that. But who could expect that conscripted Belarusian soldiers would leave their ranks in protest of this invasion and of their own dictator? Putin has lost this cultural political war because his invasion is exclusively now an exercise in criminal brutality. Even Russian soldiers and citizens are protesting by laying down their arms in Ukraine, carrying placards in Russian streets. But there are not yet enough Russians protesting to end this war. But their resistance fractures the morale and the cultural sense of this invasion. This is not, however, a simple opposition between good and evil. A distinction social scientists do make when we talk about genocide, and we do make it now when we talk about the invasion 
by Putin of Ukraine. But Ukrainians are asking us to think beyond that simple opposition. There is a fissure in the solidarity of Ukraine. Should we be above all concerned with the dynamics of escalation and de-escalation? Nobody, nobody wants to see World War III. But Ukrainians and those who heed them have said that World War III has already begun. Putin has nothing to lose. His ego needs victory at any cost. He will not stop. He must be stopped. Dating World War III's start is at the heart of the real debate that shapes global futures. It is evident today, today, in how the world responds to Ukraine's call for a no-fly zone. Just a few hours ago, Polish authorities have sent their MiG-29 jets, or have announced they will send them to Rammstein to make it available for Ukrainian pilots who know how to fly them. This ingenuity is a way of providing the support that Ukrainians need, but at the same time to pretend that NATO is not at war. Ukrainian courage and their warnings are making it hard to keep from fighting. The terrific leadership of President Zelensky and the alternative masculinity that he represents is one that is inspiring many. Sociologist Mihailo Vinitsky is someone I follow on Facebook. Read him. He spoke yesterday about the everyday acts of courage, like Vitaly Skakun who blew up a bridge and blew up himself in the process in order to slow the invasion from Crimea. We hear it and see it in the pictures of the bravery of all of these people, especially women who are carrying the burden of families as men between ages of 16 and 60 cannot leave Ukraine because they must fight. And I see it. When you see children being asked to draw pictures of what this war looks like, and there is a competition online to see what these children are seeing. So I ask you, do you remember how February began when the world was debating whether Putin would invade Ukraine? Do you remember how Ukrainians had to tell the rest of the world that Putin had already invaded eight years ago? Do you remember that distinction? Can you remember it now when you want to deny that in many ways World War III has already begun? Do you remember that distinction now when you want to believe that this is not your fight? Can you still say that this is not a matter of good and evil? And can you even wonder whether evil thrives when good people do nothing? That, at least, is what I keep hearing in my head when I hear others say, Slava Ukraini. Glory to Ukraine. Perhaps that is all something we should learn to say, or we should all learn to say. <laughs> so, Diaku Yuduje. Thank you. Thank you. So, I know I promised you time for questions, and we do have seven minutes left. <laughs> um, 
for As general. you heard, uh, Lyle Goldstein is continuing his crisis seminar, which will be on Thursday at 4.30 in McKinney Conference Room. So do come there. But if someone has questions now, you might come to the microphones and ask them. Just how many you want? Can you all stand by the microphones? You all ask your questions, and then we'll see how much time we have for the answers. So try to make them brief. Uh, yeah, sure, I will try to make this brief. Uh, I guess my question is, what is the future in terms of the Russian currency, namely the ruble? Will it continue to fall? And perhaps the follow-up to that is how will this impact the global reserve currency system, namely the dollar system, and perhaps to a lesser extent, perhaps to a lesser extent, the euro, which I do believe is the second largest reserve currency. What, what kind of ripple effects financially we're going to see uh, as the crisis unfolds? Uh, this you. is open to any panelists. I Thank you. Come. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let's hear all the questions, then the panelists can answer. Uh, hi, this is mostly in response to Omer. Um, I've heard the phrase that, that this is an 18th century war in the 21st century thrown around recently. And I'm curious, in the discussion of historical parallels, um, have, have we misjudged what the 21st century is? Or is that just uh, a misstatement and this is a very unique situation that just seems like an anomaly? Thank you. Uh, hi, um, thank you for your time. My question is about the uh, no-fly zone. I'm 22 years old, I'm not a jingoist. Um, if we were engaged in a war with Russia, I would be the first one um, to go. Um, my question is, given the failure of Russian military uh, strategy and policy thus far, um, would a strictly kind of civilian aid, fly zone, no fly zone, should it be on the table in terms of NATO policy or something the, the Europeans could do or the Americans could do? Um, given that at this point, I think it's something like 70% of the main force um, of Russia's military more broadly is engaged and bogged down in Ukraine. Um, I understand the ramifications of a direct conflict, but I have, um, I, 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 I don't believe necessarily it being the best interest of uh, Russia. So about the no-fly zone, I've, I would love to hear what you guys think. Thank you. Thank you. I'd really like to thank the panelists for their awesome, diverse perspectives on the war. Uh, my question is, uh, I was wondering how effective Putin's disinformation campaign was within Russia. Do the majority of Russians support him? And if so, what are the, is there a significant chance that there is a path out of the war through internal pressures? maybe through the Russian people, through his oligarch friends, or through senior advisors? OK, last one. Yeah, I also wanted to thank the panelists. It was a very interesting uh, panel. My question is for Ed Steinfeld. And uh, it's about, you said, you talked about the failure of the uh, post-Cold War, continued Cold War security apparatus. And you suggested that uh, different tactics should be deployed with China rather than those that were isolation. I didn't quite understand that because I don't, you know, in many respects, Russia was not isolated. And so uh, I, I'm not, I, I don't fully understand what you thought the security apparatus was that failed and how it differs um, from the one that should not be explored in the case of China. So if you could just elaborate on that, I'd be grateful. Thanks. Thank you. So panelists, some of you have specific questions. Others might want to either talk about no-fly zone or currency. Anyone volunteers to go first and I'll, offer brief remarks? I'll Anna. go first on, the, uh, on Russia's uh, propaganda and its effectiveness inside Russia. Um, so I'm from Ukraine, uh, but I'm a native Russian speaker, so I've been following uh, the messaging. So. Um, Russia hasn't had truly uh, free speech, especially truly free and independent mainstream TV that everybody gets um, for almost 20 years. And uh, so in fact, Putin's crackdown began with an attack on the freedom of the press and the freedom of speech. For the last few years, any independent news media, if they were publishing in Russian, in, inside Russia, they had to put in a disclaimer that says, we are a foreign agent. So. They, they don't have to be a, a, an agent of 
uh, of a foreign government, as long as they're not like state-controlled, state-approved news media, they had to put this disclaimer. So that environment, of course, creates um, kind of a zombie, <laughs> zombie situ situation when it comes to Russian citizens, and most of them just believe wholesale whatever the TV is spewing at them. And it's only a minority that um, are critical of what they're getting. And of course, Russians, I mean, there's the long story. <laughs> R Russians, ki they kind of know that the government's not being straight with them, but they also have learned of many generations not to ask questions because that's dangerous. So, so that's kind of the information climate. Um, however, if you look at kind of the recent development and just how shocking it is, and is it penetrating? So on state TV, they, I, they, they're not using the word war, they're using the word special military operation. <laughs> they are um, totally in denial about what's going on. Um, but people do have internet. So, if, so Navalny's group did a um, study in the, kind of in the last um, 10 days. They, did as they asked the same questions to internet users of Moscow, and they've observed a shift in public opinion from the majority supporting what they thought was a special military, op military operation to the majority condemning it. Um, so I, it's, I think the reality, like you can bend reality to your will and you can create a, an artificial media environment, but it can only work so long. So. I, I mean, I don't know the real answer, but, I, but they've been very effective in creating kind of a, a, virtual, <laughs> a virtual environment and an alternative facts for 20 years. Um, but Thank hopefully you. it won't last much longer. Thank you. Um, yeah, Lyle. Uh, yeah, just uh, comment quickly on the no-fly zone. I must say I, I think it's a terrible idea. I think uh, this is the uh, most obvious fuse to get into World War III. I think it, it would probably very quickly escalate into a NATO-Russia war full on. I think one reason that Russia is uh, kind of failing militarily is that there, a lot of their units are being held back, a lot of their munitions, the Air Force and so forth. So uh, to me, this is extremely dangerous. And uh, moreover, Russia actually has uh, invested very heavily in tactical nuclear weapons. So I, I would expect, you know, with maybe, I don't know, 20, 30, 50 percent probability, the likelihood of tactical nuclear strikes following within maybe even 24 hours of a massive air battle starting in western Ukraine. So I strongly uh, recommend against a no-fly zone. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Can I say? Sure. I mean, this, I, you know, uh, Lyle and I are, have been uh, anticipating this conversation. <laughs> that we can say, right? And <clears throat> so one of the things that I frankly worry about is whether this will ignite World War III. But I'm also not willing to put it in a categorical distinction between supporting a no-fly zone and opposing a no-fly zone. So that, for instance, one of the things I know so much less about that I would ask Lyle, but in another circumstance, maybe on Thursday, is to reflect on the proposition, for example, that by increasing the supply of Stinger surface-to-air missiles, we could, in effect, create a limited no-fly zone over at least the western part of Ukraine. This is not putting NATO against Russia. It is continuing the same, except giving increased capacity yeah, for that's, that's much Ukrainians more, much to more stop. That's much more reasonable. I think better for us. Uh, can I respond to the, <laughs> so there was a question about the nature of the war, and then um, I want to make two other very quick points. So it's, it's a very good question, what sort of war is it? It's not an 18th century war for sure, because that's a sort of professional army, so I, I don't think it's that. I don't think that, that that's a good analogy, but, but what is it? So I think in some ways it's a sort of conventional war, a conventional historical war. It also has elements of being a civil war, as has been mentioned. I mean, people are speaking uh, largely the same language, and there are large numbers of Ukrainians in Russia, large numbers of Russians in Ukraine. There are large numbers of ethnic Ukrainians who speak Russian. It's, uh, it's a big uh, mixed bag. It's also, of course, a war of independence, and especially for Ukrainians, it is, it is yet another war of independence from Russia, 
It's potentially, as was just said, a nuclear war, and it's certainly potentially a world war. And in many ways, it, and I think in the eyes of uh, many Ukrainians who are talking about it, it's basically already an insurgency, and that there is a long history of that. So I think it has all these elements, and it can transform into one or another, depending on how long it continues. There are two, two other comments I wanted to make. One, one about um, Michael's uh, Slava Ukraina. So I, I, I personally always had a problem with that because if you went to Lviv uh, five years ago, uh, there would be a cafe there which was by kind of uh, supporters of the Ukrainian insurgent army of World War II, uh, ultra-nationalists, uh, arguably neo-Nazis, and in order to enter that cafe, you had to respond to this Slavo Ukraina thing. So now it means something else, but it contains within it, within it that historical moment that Ukrainians know, but the West now being very pro-Ukrainian doesn't know and it talks without any knowledge of that history. And the last thing about protests in Russia, so I, I've heard from a number of Ukrainians who are how should I put it, somewhat pissed off by that, because they say, uh, now they're protesting. What happened in 2014? No one protested. But now it's, well, I mean, there are good reasons to protest, but we have to remember, when did protests begin in the United States against Vietnam? When did protests begin in Algeria against, in France against the war in Algeria? When, uh, you know, young uh, conscripts were in danger. Then people protested, but they didn't when Putin was snatching bits of Ukraine. So we also have to put that into context and understand you know, uh, the, the realities of this situation and how long will these protests continue and under what circumstances. Thank you. Um, I'll just say, say one thing. Uh, uh, because I think it's important and kind of ironic in a, in, a, in a bunch of different ways. You know, in as much as the birth of uh, Ukrainian nationalism might be located in 1648 and Helmitsky and Helmitsky Jewish history is a, a tragedy and a, a pogrom, um, I think at this point it's really dangerous to paint those colors on a country that has elected a Jewish comic as president on the heels of having a Jewish president and prime minister before, and a whole busload of Jewish oligarchs who could easily be blamed for lots of things that they're not being blamed for and have indeed uh, come to Ukraine's defense. On the other side, and I should have said this, that uh, the one European country who has not behaved so well in all of this is Israel. Um, and uh, the Israelis have been bad on taking in non-Jewish -Ukra non Ukrainians. Uh, they have been uh, trying to, they, they, the head of the World Jewish Con uh, Congress is a billionaire buddy of Putin's and there's noise in that relationship that uh, is not in the rest of Europe. So the, the, the paradoxes and difficulties of the situation are uh, deep and, and, and profound, but the one thing that I think we should stop doing is, is uh, painting Ukraine with its historic anti-Semitism. I really think that that is a small fringe, uh, uh, and we all have, know we have our own kooks. Um, so, you know. But. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tony. I know people are leaving. We'll try to wrap this up in another five minutes. Just to let you know, there are over 170 people watching this online live, so there is a big audience. Um, anyone wants to still answer about the currency or the global security infrastructure? Uh, not so much that, but the other the question, thanks for asking about NATO. My point there was that in recent decades, NATO has been, I think mostly with U.S. pressure, repurposed for a variety of uses and operations. Uh, Libya, Iraq, China now. And I think that 
um, drift and lack of purpose creates problems if one were if one believed that the point of NATO was to counter Russia, the other objectives, I think, divided allies in ways that um, diluted the focus on Russia. Alternatively, if one felt that the rapid expansion of NATO in the late 90s and early 2000s you know, humiliated Russia or whatever, created a, a, a politics of animosity, that's, again, something that should be discussed and thought out. But my concern is the drift and the lack of focus, which created enough distance between the allies and between the US and, and other NATO allies to create what I would guess is a perceived opening on Putin's part to act, uh, and that's a problem. And I would say maybe, if not similarly, somewhat analogously in East Asia right now, there is a almost non-existent or barely existent security architecture in which the US primarily is pushing a strategy of containment that's not immediately appealing to a number of its potential allies who want to maintain an economic relationship with China, although they're afraid of China. And that kind of somewhat abortive effort on the part of the United States runs risks. Number one, it runs risks of creating this perception of distance with allies, which is a problem if you believe China is aggressive. And alternatively, it creates a situation in which the US is taking overt actions, you know, using terms like calling Taiwan a strategic asset, which do arguably cross red lines from the past and raise the risk of conflict. So my only point is to argue for a more purposive focus on what an architecture could look like. And I don't think one can be effective entirely cutting out major players in the region, including mainland China. Thank you. A brief remark? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I would just uh, quickly underline what um, uh, Ed Steinfeld said. I, I do I do also consider it, uh, well, failed security architecture in uh, in Europe and also increasingly in Asia, I think you know NATO's lurch to the to the Far East has been um, poorly thought out and, and now is having ramifications. But also, I've watched NATO expansion quite up close. And and one, you know, please go back and read uh, George Kennan's uh, statement uh, in 1998, where he predicted all of this would happen. He understood that NATO expansion would absolutely trigger. Uh, Russian nationalism and all these problems. So, uh, but having seen it up close myself, and observed uh, Russian opinion on this, uh, you know, I, I don't. In my view, that this war could have been prevented, and, and that's a huge uh, tragedy in my mind. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to the audience. I want to end by uh, reading a very short poem by uh, Ukrainian-born poet Ilya Kaminsky. We lived happily during the war. And when they bombed other people's houses, we protested, but not enough. We opposed them, but not enough. I was in my bed. Around my bed, America was falling. Invisible house by invisible house by invisible house. I took a chair outside and watched the sun. In the sixth month of the disastrous rain in the house of money, in the street of money, in the city of money, in the country of money, our great country of money, we, forgive us, lived happily during the war. So I hope we don't live happily during the war. I hope we don't become complicit in this and find something that we can do, anything, continue discussing, come to study groups, come on Thursday. I know Brown is working to bring Ukrainian scholars here. Some of the people on this panel are working with Friends of Ukraine, Rhode Island, trying to collect donations to send medical supplies to Ukraine. So do, do something, and thank you.